Okay, everyone, it looks like we are live streaming. So we're going to begin the meeting. Um, and we'll ask uh, Dalia if she's on the call. If uh, Dalia, if we can uh, begin the meeting by uh, calling uh, attendance and making sure we have a quorum. Yes, I could begin. Give me one second. Okay, so to begin with attendance, um, Chair Anaya. Present. Vice Chair Lane. Present. Commissioner Aglipe. Aglipe. Okay. Um, Mayor Osbury. Commissioner Alston. Commissioner Anderson. Present. Commissioner Brutus. Commissioner Caliento. Commissioner Cooley. Present. Thank you. Ex officio Criticos. Commissioner De Laurentiis. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Dubo. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Espinosa. Commissioner Flores. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Freeman. Present. Um, Commissioner Guajardo. Alder Person Haddon. Superintendent Killen. Commissioner Mails. Present. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Malone. Commissioner Norrington Reeves. Commissioner Raymer. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Rice. Commissioner Schleiser. Present. Commissioner Thomas. And Commissioner Yonan. Present. Thank you. Okay. I believe that is everyone correct. If I missed anyone, no. Okay. So I think we're short uh, one or two people for quorum. But what we could do is while we have uh, others join, we'll move on with the agenda because we know we have some special guests today in our meeting, and we don't want to hold up the presentation. Um, so uh, I know the next item on our agenda, besides the um, uh, starting with the approval of the minutes, was any public testimony. So I'm not sure, Thalia, if, uh, if we received any last minute. Last I checked, we hadn't received any public testimony or I request guess. for public participation. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the next item that we had was approval of the minutes. Um, we are going to table until um, we can get quorum. Um, and uh, the third item on our agenda was the chair and vice chair update. So um, I will, I don't have any updates on my end. I don't know if vice chair Lane, if you have any updates on, on your end uh, or any other announcements that, that are relevant to. Uh, no, no, I don't. And I'm eager to get into our testimony with your permission. Absolutely. Uh, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, we're very fortunate today to have two uh, subject matter experts on a uh, uh, on a controversial, provocative, and thought-provoking topic, uh, and I'm uh, eager to uh, engage them in conversation and see where uh, their uh, experience and expertise takes the commission and ultimately the county. So uh, let me introduce uh, each of our two uh, expert witnesses. Um, and I will, uh, let me talk first about 
uh, Mayor Biss, uh, who is probably known to or at least familiar to most, if not all of you, uh, Daniel Biss, mayor of Evanston, Illinois, uh, has had a, a very long and uh, successful and uh, important career, uh, starting as a math professor at the U of C, which I don't know if everybody knows that, he became an organizer, and then he served both in the Illinois House and in the Illinois Senate with distinction and uh, ran as uh, an insurgent grassroots campaign for the Democratic nomination for governor, coming in second in a crowded field. Uh, he has uh, long been committed to public engagement, as evidenced by his uh, appearance here today and the work he'll talk to you about, as well as lots of other things that he's unlikely to talk about today, unless pressed. Uh, and he's also uh, known as uh, something of a political reformer who, for whom uh, economic and social justice are, are high priorities. So uh, uh, Mayor Biss, we're delighted to have you with us. And let me uh, also introduce uh, your uh, co-presenter today. Uh, and uh, uh, she is uh, Robin Roos uh, Simmons, who uh, was until fairly recently uh, a, uh, a, an alderman in uh, the city of Evanston, uh, where she served between 2017 and 2021. But she actually spearheaded the reparations initiative that uh, the two of them are going to be talking about today. This is the, the nation, as I understand it, the nation's first municipally funded reparations legislation. So they are um, not only thought leaders, but pioneers in this space. And uh, Ms. Simmons has gone on now to found a nonprofit organization called First Repair. Love the name, by the way, Robin, um, which uh, counsels uh, government units about how to introduce, consider, uh, and uh, make successful reparations initiatives of various stripes. So I don't think we could have uh, asked for two any more knowledgeable experts on this topic. And uh, they now have some history behind them in terms of where Evanston has gone and is going. And I'm curious to learn about their, uh, in as much as Daniel is a mathematician, I'm curious to see what empirical data we might have today. Uh, in terms of uh, success or how even they might define success. Uh, but the idea is for them to uh, present their actionable uh, social policy recommendations about how Cook County might think about reparations. And then uh, each of them has expressed uh, a willingness, indeed an enthusiastic willingness to work with uh, the commission in incubating uh, uh, policy recommendations that uh, we might uh, develop and present for the Cook County Board's consideration. So I thank them not only for being here today, but for their uh, 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 interest in collaborating with us so that their words today can hopefully be converted into action where uh, Cook County can similarly demonstrate thought leadership as both of them have within uh, both the city of Evanston and now through Robin's efforts uh, nationally. So uh, I, uh, I, I, I'm eagerly looking forward to your testimony. I don't know in which order you wanted to speak, but I'll, I'll defer to you as to uh, how you pick it up from here. So, so please do, and thanks again for being here with us today. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to the committee or the commission for allowing us this time to share um, I want to say to all of those public servants and the staff today, um, you are appreciated on National Public Service Week. Um, in my time in office, I understand exactly how hard um, your work is and unrecognized. So I want to say thank you today. In particular, our work with reparations um, had a very heavy lift of staff. So I want to just shout out um, public servants and staff and public servants in general. And I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, do I have the ability to, I don't, I'm not able to share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint. I don't have to use it. 
Yeah, Commissioner Anaya, uh, I did send Thalia. off to you and Thalia your slides. Yeah, Thalia, if you can uh, uh, allow <clears throat> Robin um, to be a co-host so that she can do that. And then if not, just make sure to have the PowerPoint ready just in case we have to share it. Okay, I'll, I'll make sure to make you a co-host then, Robin. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And while we're get start, getting started, um, this work takes a quite a bit of research. And what we'll do today is really share our experience and practice and even challenges in Evanston and hope that it inspires you to think about uh, the history and the opportunity, the capacity of the county and what steps that you might take. We would love to continue the conversation, but that's our hope for this presentation today. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> so as stated, our city um, is the first to advance a municipal funded uh, reparations initiative and we've learned a lot that happened in 2019 and I'll get into the timeline um, in a bit. Reparations is very different than equity. And I just wanna acknowledge the county's work um, and the great leadership of Denise Barreto and uh, the team that has worked on the equity report. Uh, but reparations is very different. It's the process of repairing, healing and restoring a people who were injured due to their group identity in violation of their fundamental human rights by a government corporation, institution or individual. And just jumping into the reparations discussion, we usually talk about compensation. That's what we hear most debated is some form of a cash benefit. But under international law, there are five components of reparations. And um, as we talk more about this presentation, uh, injured communities usually respond within this framework. And so their satisfaction and that's something that we're seeing happening quite a bit at a municipal level. I imagine at the county level as well, um, that's gonna be acknowledgements and apologies and other uh, ceremonial acts in recognition of harms or a commitment. Um, there's also compensation, which we hear about most often, a cash benefit or some type of a monetary uh, value award. Uh, like in Evanston, we have led with a 25,000 housing benefit there's restitution, there's rehabilitation, and there's guarantee of non-repetitions or cessation, which is to eliminate the harmful practices and policies. Um, and it is important to really go into the reparations conversation with a broader um, commitment or scope than just a cash benefit. <clears throat> and so Evanston being a government body has taken its first step. We have been inspired by the uh, commitment to HR 40, advancing it. It was introduced in 1989, a slavery uh, reparation uh, bill that would study the crimes of the transatlantic slave trade and its legacies. And in 2015, it was um, edited to include developed remedy proposals. So there are many institutions that are responsible for reparations and introducing this in 2019 in Evanston, it was always the hope, it was a call to action to other government bodies, including the county, Cook County, to engage in reparations appropriate for their harm, their egregious acts against the Black community, and uh, begin a road to repair. We also have uh, state commitments. We have not had an, a legislative action at the state of Illinois. Uh, California's recent task force um, has been very newsworthy and active. There are other states that are taking the steps as well. And uh, HR 40 continues to be introduced in Congress since 1989, last year making its historic uh, first time passing out of Judiciary Committee. There are enough votes in the House to pass. There is a first Everett Senate Companion Bill, S40. Um, and right now the push really is for an executive order uh, for HR 40. But in addition to government bodies, corporations, banks, insurance companies, businesses, colleges and universities, healthcare systems, individuals, families, public and private foundations, all have a role 
to play in repair. And so what I'll do, <coughs> not having the time to really do a deep dive into uh, Cook County history, um, here are three examples of cities that have advanced reparations based around a specific policy action or incident. The city of Amherst, Massachusetts, around its racial covenants in Evanston, we are looking at our anti-Black zoning laws and housing policies. And in Tulsa, uh, their pursuit of reparations is based around the race massacre. Um, only a couple of days ago, winning a um, opportunity to go to trial. So they have both a legislative approach to reparations and a legal uh, challenge to reparations with the lawsuit pending um, in the courts there. In Cook County, we have a host. I mean, looking at our disparate data uh, in the county and our historic uh, anti-Black practices, not to call out the county, this is a issue in all government bodies. Um, there is certain to be a specific anti-Black racist policy, multiples of them probably, um, that can be addressed and remedied in a tangible and measurable way. Um, just thinking about the, um, the, uh, the filing of uh, racial covenants and with Cook County and the um, construction of the Eisenhower Expressway and, and different examples that uh, were harmful to the Black community specifically and that would need to be reported on with extensive research. <clears throat> Here's something that inspired uh, me and many others in Evanston to begin this reparations work. Redlining uh, is, was federally enforced and outlawed with fair housing. But this is our historic redlining map in Evanston, Illinois. It is also the exact map of our most concentrated poverty our uh, largest Black population, the most disinvested, inferior infrastructure, fewer community amenities, um, and so on. And so we can see that although there have been some policy change, there has not been enough or really any specific reparative action to address our, um, our racial gaps in Evanston. Here is another piece of data that uh, really disturbed me every day in office and before that leading to running for office is a $46,000 household income divide uh, between Black Evanston and White Evanston. Um, Cook County may be a wider gap than that. Um, our life expectancy gap in Evanston is 13 years difference between Evanston uh, Black and White residents. Um, it was disheartening to find out in Chicago, it's 30 years difference. So I'm very confident there is a need and opportunity, um, the data to back up pursuing reparations for the county. Um, here's a list of cities that we at First Repair and I have worked with. Um, this city, this map has grown. Uh, this was from last year, December. Uh, but here's a list of cities that have begun their road to repair with legislative action. Um, in fact, there are now over 400 communities, uh, both municipalities and states that have begun their road to reparations. You can see the map, it's interactive. It'll categorize if it is compensation, satisfaction, restitution, and that map is available at redressnetwork.org. One of our partners, the African-American Redress Network, has played a very important role in supporting the city of Evanston with research and also um, su capacity building support with uh, legal support. And it is a collaboration between Howard uh, Law School, the Thurgood Marshall Law Center and Columbia University. <clears throat> and this really speaks to what happens when you go into a Black community and you engage the Black community to lead in what re reparations looks like to the Black community? How would the Black community prescribe it? And it is important that there is stakeholder leadership in this work. This is a very uh, grassroots, community-based, informed work. And this is a list of uh, actual examples that were given by residents in Evanston. 
uh, mental health, fair housing, trauma care, financial literacy, wealth transfer policy reform, free college tuition at Northwestern. There was a long list, but here's an example of some of the recommendations for repair that came out of those community meetings that happened in 2019. And here's just a timeline and I'll kind of breeze through it, but I share it as an example to show how much process is involved in advancing reparations. And so I like to start our timeline in 2002 where we had a reparation uh, resolution that was passed. It was led by Judge Lionel Jean Baptiste. He was the Alderman of the Second Ward at the time. He and many, many others returned from the World Conference Against Racism in 2001 and began to lead the passing of these reparation resolutions at local and state levels. This was to support HR 40. Ours also had recommendations to our school district to include more uh, Black and uh, African history. Uh, we moved on to introducing, and this is an era that reparations discussions actually started in February of 2019. Um, there were many actions that happened since then, um, including an important resolution that committed to uh, ending uh, structural racism in November of 2019, and this was after dozens of community meetings, listening sessions, um, um, town hall meetings, and so on. Please forgive me, I'm recovering from COVID and I'm having some lingering effects. <laughs> um, but we had many, many meetings, ward meetings, council meetings, uh, reparation meetings. And this work was led uh, by our Equity and Empowerment Commission. And so why I'm excited that your commission has requested this presentation, it will take a commission, not the full body, but a commission to begin to really incubate the work, develop the thinking, connect with the partners and engage with the community. And that was the thinking in introducing it to a committee first so that it had gone through a robust process before it went for a full council vote. There are other committees at the county um, that I'm learning more about and partners that could be helpful um, in terms of helping with research, the historian's office and um, the county clerk, of course, and then the archive office um, as well uh, would be very helpful in my opinion in helping with the research. Moving on, more community meetings, subcommittee meetings. We had a reparation subcommittee that was um, at that time led by the aldermen that served the three wards with the largest black populations. It's since expanded to include four community members, um, which is important that the community voice really has weight over even the legislative voice because it's important that it's community led. Um, we passed one of our forms of reparations in June of 2020 passing uh, resolution 54R20, which is the African Heritage Sites. Uh, we went on after our hard work to be certified by the African American Reparations Commission. Uh, they came in, worked alongside our committee staff, stakeholders in the community to vet the work, to make sure that we were on track, not doing ordinary public policy, but we were in line with the 10 point plan of reparations. You can learn more about that at uh, NARC, the National African American Reparations Commission. We did something very important and that was um, our stakeholders established a reparation stakeholder authority of Evanston. Um, Saul, your colleague can tell you more about that partnership, but it's very important. It allows our goals for reparations to be expanded through community led and own directed uh, leadership uh, directing a additional reparations fund. Um, and then March in 2021 um, is what we get the most attention for, but we actually passed reparations in 2019. In 2021, we passed our first remedy proposal, the first of my hope is many to come. That was resolution 37R19, and that is a direct response to our uh, housing discrimination it is a $25,000 direct benefit that will um, build wealth in home ownership for Black residents um, that are eligible based on our eligibility criteria. Our applications for that opened later in that year. 
and we selected randomly our first recipients. And I'm very proud to say that we are um, dispersing reparations at this time in Evanston already having selected and dispersed our first uh, reparation benefits. <clears throat> Additionally, and I'm almost done, there are many, many partners that are gonna be needed to do the work. This will not be your task alone. You will need uh, stakeholders first through some sort of a process. Um, you can engage them or there may be a stakeholder body that you wanna engage with. In our community, we had those that are listed here. Um, legal is important and it was my first request for uh, staff on our reparations committee. Our corporation council has been key in the legal framework and framing um, how we narrowly tailor our remedy to our harm so that we have more than an aspirational uh, reparations program, but one that is tangible and in action and that we will be measuring. Um, in addition to that, the African-American Redress Network, Thurgood Marshall Law Center has been helpful. Government bodies are gonna be very important, not just the commission, not just the county board, but there will likely be other government uh, bodies that are necessary. And then national reparation organizations were our partner in educating our community, educating our council, our partners on what reparations is, understanding the history of it, understanding that it's not a novel idea. Black folks have been fighting for liberation, empowerment, and redress for centuries. Uh, we have HR 40. We also have uh, special field or, order uh, 15 and other efforts of reparations. And they were important in coming and hosting town halls, bringing in national leaders, including Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, the fearless leader of HR 40, uh, Danny Glover, who is a um, known global reparation advocate and other experts. And then we have uh, local historians. In our case, Shorefront Legacy Center played an important role in preparing our harms report or our case for reparations in Evanston. He was supported by the Evanston History Center. The county will have plenty of options for uh, historian support. Banks are gonna be important. And then allies, um, our interfaith community and our non-Black community supporting and standing in solidarity with the Black community for this legislation was very important. We had to have a funding mechanism in Evanston. We started with cannabis sales tax appropriately being that 71% of our marijuana arrests were in the black community while we were 16% of the population. That's a real problem. And then researchers, likely an academic partner, uh, so many to choose from here in, in the Chicagoland area. Uh, Howard Law School and Columbia were our partners. Philanthropy, I'm hoping that your colleague Saul can jump in there, <clears throat> and then local reparation uh, support, which is um, first repair. And so this is the work that we do full time now in informing cities. Um, there is no exact path to reparations, but there are definite best practices that um, should be modeled. Every history is going to be different, circumstances, capacity, um, political will and, and so on are gonna be different from city to county to state and so on. And I think that's it. I wanted to really breeze through that so I could really leave time for Mayor Bisp to add on to that and make sure that we had time for um, Q and A. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Simmons. And we undoubtedly will have all kinds of questions. But let's defer those until we hear from the mayor. And thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, well, thank you um, very much uh, to the commission, to Sharonaya, to Mark for inviting us. Um, I encourage Robin to go first because I knew that um, her presentation would cover everything. And uh, I was, of course, not disappointed. So I, I just want to um, quickly make three points points to uh, supplement and augment what Robin already went through. And, and I know that we're, you know, we're already well, well past the first half of the hour. And so I, I wanna do that as quickly as possible to leave time for questions and discussion. Um, the first thing I wanna say that, that Robin mentioned at the end that I think is worth dwelling on for a bit is the importance of the role that historians played in what we're doing in Evanston. You don't need uh, the credentials of a 
of a skilled historical researcher to know that institutional racism exists and the governments have engaged in anti-Black behaviors. And yet, even though we all kind of know this, having a meticulously researched clear document that goes through specifically actions taken by the city of Evanston as a government, as a corporate body that uh, reinforced institutionalized racism, that enforced segregation, uh, that had concrete and deliberate negative effects on Evanston's black community is a really important starting point for, for this. So that we have some documentation of what it, problem we're trying to solve. Understanding that the broader problem of the, the legacy of the crime of slavery and, and institutional racism in America is tragically a bigger bite than the city of Evanston can take by itself. But much to our shame, we own, because of our own concrete past actions, uh, a part of today's uh, wealth gap between black and white households in Evanston health outcomes gap between black and white individuals in Evanston, educational gap between black and white students in Evanston. We own that because of what we did as a city. And we believe uh, that, that uh, those actions that we engaged in, those shameful actions incurred a debt. And, and part of what we're doing with this effort is, is uh, making a commitment to over time repay that debt. Uh, so I think the, the work that Evanston historians did in laying the, the foundation here, I think, um, is, is really a pivotal part of this. Uh, the second thing I want to say is the one part that I can really, I think, add something to because this is something that Robin probably doesn't want to say herself. Uh, but the, the leadership that Robin demonstrated uh, immediately upon taking office in 2017 and moving this forward uh, is really, it's really, really pivotal. Um, it was not novel in 2017 for elected officials to be talking about reparations or thinking about reparations um, or advocating to create study committees to further discuss reparations. And it's understandable that so much of this discourse has been rooted in the let's study it some more uh, approach simply because there's so much to study. It's complicated. It's legally complicated. It's morally complicated. It's politically complicated. It's technically complicated. It's just a hard thing to do. And so you could, you could talk about it forever. And what Robin had the moral clarity to do was to say, as important as those discussions, which will continue may be, the need to have those discussions doesn't get us off the hook from our moral responsibility to actually take tangible action. And, and kind of rounding that corner from this is a concept to this is a set of programs that we want to design and implement um, was, was groundbreaking. You can see it in all the pins in the map that she showed about other communities that are looking to her for, for examples, but it also just had some pragmatic consequences because once you're talking about setting up a program, you're confronted with a lot of practical operational program design questions that that sort of don't feel pressing if it's just a theory or a concept, but are, are absolutely uh, urgent if it's a program that you wanna stand up and have running effectively shortly. And so that, that kind of transformation and what the question even was, it, it was really, really critical here. And, and part of what's so exciting to me about talking to jurisdictions beyond Evanston's borders about uh, this work is the importance that I attach to the maintenance of that situation, right? What I don't want to see happen, and what I'm pleased to say I think is not happening, is Evanston does this one thing, and then everybody else goes back to, hey, let's think about reparations for another couple of decades. Instead, I, I think what would be really, really uh, important, both morally, but also pragmatically, is to see municipalities and other government bodies like Cook County from across the country try this to establish a library of best practices and a community of professionals who've been involved in implementation. Um, you know, all of that um, feeds off itself to create both better execution and more momentum for more execution. Um, and the last thing that I, I wanna say is that we are proud in Evanston of having reached the stage just in the last few weeks of uh, the first tranche of um, reparations recipients being named and reparations being given 
uh, out uh, to, to those individuals. Um, but it's really the very, very, very beginning of the road. And for instance, uh, Robin mentioned on one of her slides that the initial commitment that's been made is of $10 million. The first $10 million that comes in in sales tax of uh, sale of recreational cannabis will go into the reparations fund to be allocated to, to do this repair work. Nobody in this town, to my knowledge, believes that that's enough money. Nobody wants to suggest that $10 million is gonna you know, make us even and, and, and fully compensate for the, the crimes that the city of Evanston committed uh, historically. We, we don't say that, and I think it would be really insulting and wrong to say that. We, we simply view this as a, a, a down payment and a, a beginning of really morally necessary work. But as partial as that $10 million may be, the first tranche of, uh, of reparations support that's been allocated is $400,000, 4% of that $10 million. And this is, um, you know, obviously this is a natural consequence of being the first, having a whole series of technical questions about program design, wanting to make sure we do it right and properly and responsibly. In that situation, you're going to move slowly. But the point that I wanna make is that I believe it's also a strength. I think that in a situation where this concept is so new, where there are even in just this humble town of Evanston, so many different people with different ideas about how reparations funds ought to be allocated. The fact that we're not just spending it all in one go, but carefully designing a restorative housing program that utilizes 4% of the funding and then going back and the reparations committee of which Robin is one of seven members will ask itself the question of now what? And what is the next, uh, the next uh, tranche of money gonna look like and how will it be allocated? Um, and the opportunity, if it continues to be doled out in these relatively small uh, increments is to try a lot of different things and to, to hear the many different ideas in the community and do as best we can to implement them faithfully and responsibly and carefully, and then really have an opportunity to look at different things and learn from them and use that learning to guide not only our own uh, efforts at repair in the future, but also using it to inform what will happen in other communities. And so I, 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 there's, of course, a very different spin you could put on this. You could just be frustrated that things are slow. You could, you could be impatient and want things to move more quickly. And I'm, I'm pretty good at impatience and wanting work toward justice to move more quickly. But I, I do think that the fact that we're going to learn so much by doing this methodically and one step at a time will turn out to be a really important asset for the whole community and for the movement. So. So with that, I'm really appreciative of the chance to be with you and, and I wanna cut it off here and, and make sure we have time for, for discussion. Well, thank you, Mayor Biss, and uh, thank you for your extraordinary leadership and the same to Ms. Simmons. And uh, without e either of you, I am quite confident this would not have happened because it stalled for a lot of years until- That's not true, yeah. that's not true. Not true? Yeah, this would, there's no way this would have happened without Robin, but this would have happened without me. And I don't, I don't say that as false modesty. I just, I think it's important in an issue that's as um, historic as this to be transparent. Um, the, there actually has not been a vote on reparations uh, at the council level uh, of a lot of, of real significance since I took office uh, almost exactly a year ago. Um, this really was work led by Robin. Um, and I'm a, a massive fan, the biggest cheerleader you're going to find. And I, uh, intend to continue actively supporting the work as it moves forward. But I, I think I just want to be transparent on an issue like this. Um, it really, the, the heavy lift, the bulk of the heavy lifting on the elected official level was done before I took office. And I would, I would hate to take credit where it's not due. Okay, we will deny you that credit to which you are not <laughs> entitled. And at the same time, recognize that you've already committed that this is the first of other initiatives and uh, you are a catalyst, and clearly you are the one that's going to build on the early success of this program. So I will thank you for that, if not for that which I've attempted to thank you for, and you've uh, declined. So thanks to both of you. And I think there are undoubtedly going to be uh, lots of questions here. So I will open it up to the uh, commission. And I have several of my own, but I'll uh, hold my fire until others have had an opportunity. Please. I think Commissioner Anderson has his hand 
Yeah, Commissioner Anderson, I should point out, uh, Sal, before you speak, uh, Commissioner Anderson, as many of you may know, is the executive director of the Evanston Community Foundation. And he, too, has been a, a very important participant in this process and continues to be. And we are very fortunate to have him having graciously uh, agreed to uh, lead a working group around this topic. Uh, so all of you who are interested in contributing to that work, uh, I would invite you to reach out to Commissioner Anderson and myself. Uh, however, uh, I also want to caution you, uh, don't include all the other commissioners in your emails because you will inadvertently trip a wire, that wire being the Open Meetings Act. So if you could just limit your email communications initially to either Commissioner Anderson or myself or both of us, expressing your interest and willingness to uh, serve on his working group, uh, we would both be grateful to you. So thank you, uh, Commissioner Anderson, for uh, your, your willingness to, to lead that effort. And I, I see that your virtual hand continues to be up. So I will, uh, <laughs> I will invite you to say whatever it is you wanted to say, and thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you so much, uh, Mark, and thank you to to Robin and, and, and Daniel for, for talking so much about this. I just wanted to, you know, um, click on a few a few points. First of all, I wanted to just really stress how important Robin's dedication to this work was and like building a, a champion on the local level. Um, you know, we Robin and I have been going around making rounds at a few philanthropic conferences talking to philanthropy about the case for reparations there and we brought the most recent one, the ABFI conference, it used to be the Association of Black Foundation Exec Executives in Washington, D.C. We had a colleague from, from NARC, National African American Reparations Commission, I believe is the, the acronym, but um, who, who I think rightfully <clears throat> called Robin the Rosa Parks of the reparations movement, right? The spearhead who really broke through. And I think to have her in Evanston and in our county and locally here, we just can't understate the importance of that, right? Um, of pushing that work forward. And so, you know, as we are all here doing our work um, in different levels at the, you know, the government level and with uh, nonprofit organizations and private sector leaders and, you know, philanthropic leaders, um, just remembering the importance of getting behind our local leaders, our on the ground leaders, the folks who are driving the work and putting the sweat in. Like we also outside of this commission as individuals in our respective communities have the opportunity to do that. And so I don't, you know, regardless of the work that comes out of this, there's a lot of work that we can do at our local level to make sure that that happens. Um, and I think it's, you know, really particularly important in this space to talk about black leadership because ultimately what, what reparations is, is about is black autonomy, right? Is about black folks being able to control their destiny in ways that have been not been afforded to us uh, historically. And so, you know, Robin was a real spearhead for that. And so I didn't wanna, you know, take up too much time, but I just wanted to jump in, thank them both and just let them know that there is a growing movement across the country. And we, you know, be, by virtue of <laughs> having Robin here and having passed this in Cook County, we have a chance to be a real leader and show the world how to do this. And so I'm excited to pick up this work with this commission and, and continue to grow it. Well, thank you. And by the way, uh, Saul, if you would please add me to your roster of people interested in participating in your working group, I would appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, so, and you can find my contact information. It's it's just um, and Anderson at evanstonforever.org. Um, I think, uh, yeah. Commissioner Dubow, do you have a, a comment or a question? Yeah. <clears throat> so just a, a comment and a quick question. So thank you both, Mayor Biss and Robin, for um, the presentation and, and the groundbreaking work. It's, it's inspiring. And I want to thank our chair and vice chair actually for teeing this all up for us and for the commission starting to, to dig into this. I, just a, a, qu a question, How, what were the ways that you engaged community on this? Because undoubtedly, you know, it's essential. And I'm sure you had very um, creative and meaningful ways of doing that. I could tell from the way you were speaking about it. So I'd be interested in the Black community, but also other stakeholders in the community. How, how did you do that? Thank you for the question. And that was the first priority. It was, um, so being a, a local elected leader, you know, we, it was very guerrilla, uh, grassroots. Um, it was community meetings. It was um, tapping into our um, 
historically Black institutions, namely the church, really the faith community is a um, predominant way to reach the Black community in, you know, barber shops and beauty shops, getting the information to those places where the Black community is, and then holding community meetings. Really informal. Um, at the meetings, I only asked three questions. The commission only asked three questions. Um, what forms of reparations would you like to see? How do you think we might fund it and who should qualify? And we took that information and we organized it in a way that we categorized it in kind of what's within our purview as a municipality, um, what is specific to the harm, and that's what informed the direction and the criteria outlined for our legislation. But through using social sites. I wish I had a more sophisticated answer, but, you know, I had no budget and no staff and, you know, did it while working full time. So it was uh, community meetings, ward meetings, announcements at call of the wards for city council meetings, newsletters, social media, um, and black clubs and very grassroots. Now, had I had a budget, it would have included things like surveys. I mean, now I have a wish list and I go into communities that are putting aside a budget to actually operate and advance the reparation goals, um, surveys and other methods, uh, stipends even for stakeholders in the community to be a leader for this work. There's a lot of ideas when there are resources, but I did it the old school way. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Freeman. <clears throat> um, great, great presentation. Um, it's, I never thought I would see like a viable, tangible outcome to the reparations discussion. So like, this is super, um, inspiring. And so as I do work in, in West Garfield Park in Garfield Park in Chicago, so the West side, um, and this community as well as others have gone through like quality of life planning processes. Has there been any consideration on how to layer the approach for reparations in those discussions with those types of planning processes that don't always have um, specific policy asks? Like I hear, I hear this being a framework that can be layered um, to support a lot of the things that communities have said they want to see. So Pullman has talked about trying to get more housing for people and keeping, you know, homeowners in the area, but there isn't necessarily a specific tool on how to go about that. So has there been explicit thought on how to layer that work? So you're exactly right. Um, even with the $25,000 benefit without what you're talking about, layering financial literacy, access to financial tools and products that are reparative, uh, we've not done nearly enough. So yes, uh, but more needs to happen, quite honestly, so much more needs to happen, even in the work that we're doing in Evanston. Um, and, and so I think that a, ben a tangible benefit or any form of compensation should go along with other wraparound uh, services, access to information and education as well. One thing that happened when we began to engage the community on what they want for reparations, we found how much we were not getting the existing information to the community. So there were already some underutilized programming and benefits that just weren't getting to the right households. And that allowed us to even better serve immediately. So I can say immediately, once we engage in the reparations discussion, our city staff and services were more effective in reaching the community and delivering services that we had already that were really good. And in fact, some of the recommendations from the community for reparations were already um, available programming. They just didn't have the information. So one thing that I like to say is with the, we haven't really measured this, but what advancing the reparations commitment has done for our city it has increased uh, support of Black businesses and increased um, Black leadership on boards, committees, and commissions and, and you know, new roles in the city and so on. Um, so yes to your question, and we have begun to do wraparound services. I personally, um, independent to the committee, have begun working with banks 
to challenge them to develop uh, reparative mortgage products and financial products. I've been successful in getting the nation's largest Black bank, uh, Liberty Bank, to develop programs as well as self-help credit union. There's one on the South side and Divine Bank, there's one on the North side. So they have developed products as well as um, some work that I've been doing along with Freddie Mac to get them to um, interpret or make it clear that reparative um, programming and down payment use is allowable for those banks and lenders that are using Freddie Mac. So yes to your question and a lot more work needs to be done. Thank you. Commissioner Schleiser. Yeah, I really appreciated the this presentation as well and uh, really applaud all of the work and getting started and learning. I think that that's really important in this process and we're all gonna learn from you guys taking the, the first step and uh, really applaud that. I've got two questions. One is you know, <clears throat> around all of the research that was done to really delineate the harmful practices and when you stop that process to then come up with the remedy. What were some of the challenges in that definition process that you all experience? So that's the first question. Um, and I'll ask my second question after that. Um, the challenges in um, determining the remedy based on what we uncovered? Yes. I would say the biggest challenge is one single remedy is not enough. So just taking that, you know, bold, shaky first step and realizing you have to start the work. There are more remedy options than there are resources. So I think it was just the audacity to start with one and not mind the critique which comes. So as much as we're getting all this praise and support, there's a lot of critique that comes. Um, so I think that once you uncover the harms, the remedies will be easy. The hardest uh, will be to prioritize which one you move forward with. Thank you. And the other one is about resources and what sort of conversations has Evanston has had about establishing more permanent and multiple streams of revenue for reparative funding? Like what policy changes have you looked at and what other vehicles have you looked for for creating um, long-term sustainable revenue for these sorts of programs? That came up in committee today. So we actually had a reparations committee meeting today. And we have um, initially passed the cannabis sales tax revenue. It was actually not my first thought about it, but at the time the state was passing it, it was like a divine opportunity to capture that before it was earmarked for something else. And then we had to fight for it. Um, it was actually a graduated real estate transfer tax. We have a premium tax on properties above a million dollars. That was the first thinking. And now we're at a stage where we see how much interest there is and we're really underfunded. And so we're beginning that conversation just today. Uh, we even talked about the possibility of using ARPA dollars. Some other communities that I've worked with are using ARPA dollars. Um, Providence, Rhode Island is one of them. Uh, we talked about using surplus from the general fund. You know, the, it, we need to continue this conversation and there was about 12 recommendations before we landed on cannabis. Can I, can I just add, add something to that? Um, just from the, you know, the grant making perspective or the, the, the philanthropic perspective, you know, we at, at the Evanston Community mm -hmm. Foundation, is, as Robin mentioned, we're partnering with a community led group that is still seeking 501c3 status, uh, the Reparation Stakeholder Authority of Evanston now. As a community foundation, we can hold, you know, endowed funds on behalf of agencies and individuals, and we do that with the RSAE, um, and, and we're not charging any of our fees for that. So it is a Black-led community group, and so this is not, you know, necessarily a, a pathway for municipalities or, or government entities, but, you know, thinking about philanthropic partnerships, there's a lot of space for philanthropy to jump in here, um, especially because we are frankly, bastions of wealth, and some of that wealth is, is ill-gotten, right, and gotten through some of these same processes. And I know Robin touched on this earlier, but it's really important to reiterate that government is not the only culpable party when it comes to the harm done to Black Americans, right? Um, you know, it certainly won't, won't point out, but there are, there are banks that owe, 
you know, some of the the the, the founding money that went there to to you know things that you could easily draw a line to a case for reparations for, even some of the folks who you know whose money started private foundations and community foundations, money comes from 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 oppression as well. So. Um, I think when we talk about streams of funding, we really have to be looking beyond just taxes. We have to be looking at where money is held and how we get it into the hands of people who have been denied it. And, and, and we're trying to take some steps in that way um, at ECF. And I think there's opportunities for other philanthropic partners to, to jump in there. If you want to hear more, Robin and I will be at the Grant Makers for Effective Organizations Conference next um, in two weeks, downtown Chicago, I'm talking about that. So you can you can learn a little bit more. We'll even do a little worksheet so you can go back to your own your own group your own place with a with, with, with a work plan for it. So, um, but yeah, there's there's uh, there's more than just government that needs to jump in there. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Appreciate that. We're going to attend that. Uh, Commissioner Mayles has a question or comment. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for your presentation today, and thanks to Mayor Bliss. My question is kind of simple and maybe somewhat simplistic. The uh, fact that Evanston is part of Cook County doesn't mean that it is exactly like all of Cook County. And as I look at this issue and want to know more about what can we anticipate by way of objections, what have you heard? And I mean, you know, if we could speak candidly about the fact that the Evanston political system is alderman and what are you likely to find by way of objections that we can address before we full out get behind issues thanks I would love for Mayor Biss to um, respond to that I mean I'll, I'll just jump in and say there are Mayor some Biss unfortunately had to take off so you're oh he your did way. okay I'm sorry about that um, I'm so, sorry, Rob. You're on your own. <laughs> okay. You're in good hands, though. Okay, so I'll respond. Um, initially, the um, pushback was uh, legal challenges that, you know, uh, fiscal responsibility, you know, will be legally challenged and so on. Um, surprisingly, one of the challenges that have developed um, more recently is um, what forms and when, how do we prioritize it? But you're right. I mean, Evanston is a special community and we had a initially unanimous support, eventually a nine to one votes on two different votes and we had broad support. But the pushback that I was getting as I was moving it forward was uh, legal challenges and that was mostly it and how it could be uh, fiscally irresponsible to the community. Um, but more broadly in doing this work, you know, in more partisan communities, there are going to be the obvious challenges of its reverse racism. We have had threats of legal challenges, formal threats of legal challenges. We haven't had an exact lawsuit yet, but we have been forewarned. Uh, we've had what I'm calling intimidation from conservative groups outside of even Illinois. They're not even in, in Illinois that have challenged us and doing some intimidation with um, like FOIA lawsuits and different things just to agitate our process. Um, so, you know, we live in a, in a county where there's going to be diverse perspectives, and I think you can come up with every one of those objectives, but I didn't lead with the moral argument. I laid with our data and the values of our city that were stated by the city council and community meetings at large. And so I led with this as simply an action plan to make good on all the things that we said that we valued. I mean, I, I think the moral argument should have been won 400 years ago, but I led with the data that's good for everything else that we do. It needs to be good for justice too, so. Thank you very, very much for addressing that question. Thank you. Uh, if uh, no other commissioner has questions, I have a couple of my own, if I may. Um, one is I noticed on your map, uh, there was a pin at a, uh, at, in the city of Chicago. Yes. And um, I'd be curious to learn about progress made there and whether those efforts are worth um, um, complimenting. Uh, or, and if I can invite your candor within this group, uh, if you feel that there are lessons we should learn from whatever was done or was not done in the city of Chicago and what progress may have been made and what your expectations are there. 
So I wish I had um, a, a good report and update for the city of Chicago. Uh, in, 2000, in the summer of 2020, there was an effort, grassroots led effort by Encobra, uh, a 35 year old reparation institution. It was funded by uh, Dr. Willie Wilson. <coughs> And the um, introduction was to pass a reparations commission. That wasn't approved, but they did establish a reparations subcommittee as under human services under um, Alderman Rod Sawyer. It's currently chaired by Alderman Stephanie, Col Stephanie Coleman and Alderman Vasquez. And there has been no um, progress since 2020. Well, thank there's you not that. been a meeting. There's no. There's not been any organizing. Well, uh, so there's Saul, some grassroots maybe, efforts happening. Shaw, maybe we can invite uh, Alderwoman Haddon to join our working group and see if she can uh, serve in a catalytic role as to the city. And you know, without without uh, necessarily placing a priority on which government unit leads the efforts, if we can uh, get them uh, moving along, I think that would serve our purposes in any event. Um, a second question I had is, um, I, I noticed the NARC uh, certification, and I'm curious to learn what that is, how that was secured, and what the benefit of it is. Sure. So it, the benefit of, of it is it keeps you accountable to doing reparations and not ordinary public policy that we should be doing. It gives you pretty much a checklist that you've done the steps of repair and acknowledgement, inclusive stakeholder involvement. And that certification said that under the 10 point plan of <clears throat> the National African American Reparations Commission, we have satisfied the process of reparations and they continue to work closely with us. I've since been appointed as a commissioner, uh, but I would uh, definitely recommend engagement with that commission just for education sake, if nothing else. So, so should I infer from that that you believe they are a repository of best practices in this area in terms of developing uh, initiatives? Is that, a, is that a fair characterization? So I, I would say yes, but in terms of um, they have been founded on the uh, federal reparations. So in terms of uh, who is working locally is really first repair. So that's the work that I do with- I have partners. no doubt. That, that, yeah. was, that goes without saying. Okay, yeah. But but NARC definitely, all things reparations, that's what they are established to do. And in 2019, I reached out the, to them for their support. And since then, they have joined in the sort of mentorship of local initiatives as well. So we should do the same, you believe? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And I'll have, one, I'll have one other question. And I very much appreciate your patience. And that is, I happen to read an article, uh, which you were quoted. And in fact, your picture appears. Uh, the And I, I will not attribute the uh, headline to you because I don't imagine you drafted it. Uh, California approach to reparations could reshape the national debate. The word reshape was interesting to me. The national debate is also interesting to me. And I just want to know if you might weigh in about the California approach and you think there are lessons to be learned from what's going on in California. Sure. So California pretty much took the exact HR 40 language to advance their reparations with an exception. They um, are looking to prioritize and pass about a month ago now, maybe less, a lineage-based approach to prioritizing reparations. And so in our city, we are a diverse community. The whole African diaspora is in Evanston, has been harmed in Evanston, and so we are not excluding or dividing Black people. Um, I was honestly really surprised to see that that was their first action to uh, prioritize those that can prove their ancestors were enslaved in America, especially with it being a California-based initiative. So I would expect something more hyper-local to California, but that's what their committee um, largely influenced by a group that um, only wants those that have direct lineage to the enslaved. Uh, and so that's a, that's an action. It was a narrow vote. I think it was maybe four to five or something along those lines. But it's, I don't prescribe for communities. I think that each community should do their own work. But if I were asked, I don't agree with that way, uh, especially in a community like Cook County, where we're diverse and we have 
Haitian immigrants and continental Africans that have been harmed here in Chicago during a period of, um, you know, Jim Crowing, post Jim Crowing, you know, mass incarceration and so on. There's so many harms. So I believe that the harm should inform the eligibility. And if you were harmed in Cook County, I believe there should be some redress. It may be different based on the harm, but I do believe that all people of African descent that are harmed uh, should have redress. Thank you for that. And I, I appreciate your perspective. And uh, so, and, and obviously much of, much of the debate is about definitions, not yeah. only in terms of who should qualify for benefits, but what benefits are relevant and impactful and, uh, and what, what is a reasonable budgetary approach to funding, not only the sources of funds, but the destination for those funds in terms of achieving uh, impactful outcomes. So, I mean, a, a lot of this is going to be theoretical, but at some point it needs to turn into action and you need to put your two bucks on some decision and run with it. So I, I appreciate your having done so and continue to do so throughout the nation. And I wish you very well uh, as Thank you, you continue. Um, so, and thanks too, for your willingness to work with with Sal and with me and with others here who are willing to raise their hands uh, because we will certainly want to tap into your knowledge and expertise and, as well as your, your network. And because uh, I think what we do in Cook County is going to be watched nationally. And I think that our thought leadership will be leveraged. And I think it's important that we recognize the implications for about everything we do here as the county board will do. So uh, thank you for participating today. And unless there are other questions, we're going to move on to other business. Although I do invite you to remain with us. I know you're just getting over COVID. So I'm especially appreciative for your <coughs> participating today. I was a little uh, concerned that uh, your health might not allow you to be with us today. And I'm happy to hear that uh, you're at least strong enough to do that. And I appreciate your making whatever sacrifice was necessary to join us. So thank you so much and uh, stick around if you like, we'd love to have you. If you wanna bow out, we certainly understand that as well. And again, thank you for thank all you. you've done and all you will do. Thank you all. Thank you to all of the commissioners. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks again. So I think we can move on to, uh, to other business. Um, very, very interesting and uh, important conversation. And uh, I think at this point we can uh, move on to uh, committee reports. Uh, and uh, I should say. And uh, Mark, if, if I may just uh, butt in for a second, um, I too want to just uh, thank uh, Robin um, and of course Mayor Biss. Um, uh, I just so that everybody knows, I do have to hop off. So Mark uh, will be chairing the rest of the committee. Um, we weren't able, I know we had a one point um, uh, quorum, but I think Howard had to jump off. So we will approve the minutes uh, for April at the next meeting. Uh, if that's okay with everyone, we'll make sure to resend it uh, with the next invitation for the June meeting. Um, and I thank you all for your participation. I will be off camera because I'm I'm on my way um, somewhere um, to an event. So I just want to, again, uh, thank you all. And I'm going to leave you in good hands with our Vice Chair, um, Mark Lane. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner, and I very much appreciate that. So uh, I should I should point out the um, I've had the opportunity to sit in on uh, the um, committee meetings, and I continue to do that. These, of course, are ad hoc working groups, and, uh, and we will establish them on an, uh, as necessary based upon the interests and commitment of the commission. Uh, but I, I, we have reports. I believe from two different uh, working groups today. And I'll start with uh, Commissioner Aglape. And uh, you'll recall that her working group uh, relates to the development of a diverse talent pipeline for uh, initially what's been done and being done at the Obama Foundation in connection with the construction trades. And uh, ideally uh, we'd like to see those practices, policies, that methodology employed more broadly among employers of all stripes within the county and beyond. Uh, and uh, the Obama Foundation has uh, generously uh, agreed to work with us to make that happen in a variety of ways. In fact, they've uh, now assigned two different individuals to work with us. So uh, Commissioner Aglipay, I'll, I'll, I'll turn this over to you and if you could kind of Tell us kind of uh, what, what's been accomplished thus far, where you're at, where you hope to go, and what help you might need from other commissioners.
Is she still here? I don't think she was here at roll call. No, I don't think uh, Commissioner Aglope was uh, present. Okay, well, I've just given her report then. So, um, and you know, it, it was brief if incomplete, and we'll we'll impose upon her to give us the more the uh, more fulsome version next time out. And uh, so the the next report is going to be uh, by Commissioner uh, Freeman, who uh, is leading the efforts to look at community investment vehicles. Uh, born of two different uh, um, commission meetings, uh, one by Mercy Corps relating to community investment trusts and the other uh, Chicago uh, Community Trust, uh, looking at a variety of different uh, vehicles by which uh, the uh, wealth gap and income gap within disinvested communities can be bridged uh, using investment strategies of various sorts. And uh, their, uh, Commissioner Freeman has done some uh, very heavy lifting to get where we're at already and uh, a lot of heavy lifting yet to come. And I'll defer to her to uh, kind of give you the particulars. So Commissioner Freeman, if you'd be so kind. Uh, thank you. And thank you uh, to my co-chair, Wendy. Um, for... and, oh, I should say, Commissioner Raymer, and not to slight you at all, we're deeply grateful for your contributions as well. Thank you. Um, but as Mark alluded to, uh, we started as the uh, Community Investment Trust Working Group and then expanded to Community Investment Vehicles. And part of what we are trying to evaluate is what sort of actionable item can be implemented. Um, because the Community Investment Vehicle um, as a tool is A, relatively broad, and as Robin kind of alluded to, very community driven, we want to be very thoughtful about not being overly prescriptive um, or restrictive based upon the needs of the individual communities or the individual projects that might be um, able to use a community investment vehicle. So ultimately, um, we are working on uh, like developing something to support a case for funding for some sort of pilot fund. Um, part of those dollars would be used uh, specifically in actual development, but also creating those wraparound support services, again, as Robin mentioned, um, that are necessary to ensure endeavors like this are su successful and sustainable. So that does include capacity building for existing organizations, which a lot of the discussion has been um, around the utilization of those existing entities. Um, and the reality is that isn't necessarily sustainable. Um, while there are CDFIs that have interest in participating in portions of this community investment vehicle implementation, they do not have the capacity to manage, maintain, evaluate um, the way that this thing would need to actually be done. So long term from a sustainable consideration, we are very thoughtful that there might need, there might need to be a separate entity that is created. Um, to ensure that those things are managed, maintained, and supported. But meanwhile, there is also um, consideration that there does need to be a lot of public, private participation and partnerships. So there has been the discussion about what is the role of the land bank play at the county level, as well as that corresponding consideration at the city level. Um, the inclusion, of course, of the Bureau of Economic Development, but also the Chicago Mayor's Office. And so ensuring that as many partners who have some potential role in this ecosystem of community investment vehicles are included in the conversation at the table, um, we're hearing the concerns. So while the trust has done a lot of research, um, some of our commission or our committee members have participated in that research. And we kind of tried to delve a little deeper into what some of their particular concerns are. So as we are crafting a solution, um, one of our asks is as we define what the next steps are, which would really have to do with development of eligibility, more programmatic design, um, we do need additional support in that particular lift of what does a program look like. We are also trying to make sure that this endeavor is in alignment um, with things that are going on. So 
we have, there is a member who's been invited uh, from the mayor's office, but they have not been able to participate. So ensuring that we are getting the input, buy-in feedback from some folks who have expressed interest in participating in the working group, but haven't had a chance to participate in the meetings. Um, we also have a list of things to consider. So there has been a written draft that has been circulated um, right before this meeting to the commission members. And so the request is that uh, commissioners take a look at this document, provide any additional feedback, input, insight, thoughts. Um, and if there's anyone else that wants to join the working group as we continue to meet and actually create more framework around this, that is also welcome. Wendy, uh, is there anything that I that you want to add? Um, yeah, I was really um, Robin's three questions that she always asks when she was going around and, um, you know, who should be the recipients, you know, who, sh what payment, you know, how should it be paid and all of that. Um, that was, that was, you know, part of our last committee meeting, just that discussion on like, okay, what are the like core criteria? you know, that we would want in a CIV, who are the people who need to benefit, that kind of thing. And it was an interesting discussion because, you know, we went around and around a little bit. Well, should we focus our, you know, our intent on things around the South by South by South, by, Invest Southwest, you know, corridors or Pritzker Prize where there's, you know, something going on already and, and hook on to that and that should be a criteria uh, or should it just be like hey if you have a vision for your neighborhood and you've got you know a plan for it and people ready to do it is that great too and we thought it was you know we didn't want to it's that balance of being too prescriptive but yet you also want to have you know some some guidelines so getting to that point where you know, I mean, there's a million choices out there, just like the, you know, reparation discussion, but I trying to get to, you know, a core inclusive and accessible initiative is our goal. I, uh, this is uh, Bill, I'd be happy to join the, the committee, the subcommittee. Um, this is really an important topic to be talking about. Has the yeah. I know you've been talking about kind of the wraparound services uh, and what is would help um, get things catalyzed for investment. And I think that's a really important topic. Community groups over and over again are asked to come with their ideas and do all of this work to get funding without any funding to actually support pre that, that actual development work. Yep. And everybody's tired. I can tell you that from the folks that we partner with, of having to like prove themselves to be worthy of investment vehicles. I think it's an important conversation to have. Thanks, Bill. We'll definitely wrap you into the to the subcommittee meetings. They're Tuesdays. Uh, anyways, we'll we'll forward the invites to you. Thank you, Commissioner Schleiser, for your willingness to serve on that working group. Mm -hmm. uh, anything further, Commissioner Freeman, that you'd like to uh, talk about? Well, thank you very much for to you and Commissioner Rayner for your hard work on this. It's, uh, you know, the, the goal here would be to develop uh, an ordinance uh, that is passed by the county board that actually has funding attached to it and uh, can serve as a pilot uh, to test the methodology that's developed. And uh, based upon hitting uh, prescribed metrics, uh, be expanded and rendered more permanent in nature. Uh, and uh, so this becomes really experimentation. Uh, we, you know, the, the, the county doesn't have a great uh, social Petri dish. So the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation becomes that Petri dish. And uh, so thanks to all <laughs> Thanks, of you. we're a bunch of uh, bacteria. Yeah, are you calling like microbes? You're... <laughs> <laughs> They're social as well, as I understand it. Um, yeah. So I would like to, um, one other uh, committee report I will make uh, kind of, in absentia, um, uh, Commissioner Yonan, who I understand has just uh, left for another commitment, uh, has uh, agreed to chair a working group uh, around the uh, 
presentation of uh, Reverend Elston relating to um, uh, repurposing underutilized church property for the public good. And he has recruited a few members for his working group. Uh, this too is an interesting, um, an interesting topic, one that is a little below the radar, but we're now bringing it above the radar. And uh, so if any of you would like to join in that effort, either reach out to Commissioner Yonan or myself, and we'll be happy to see that you're uh, productively put to work. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see when and how these working groups start to consolidate as we find uh, kind of interstitial areas that apply to more than one working group and uh, we'll allow that to be a free form uh, activity. It will, each of the working groups will either, uh, e either die a borning uh, or decide that there is nothing worth continuing, which is okay too, that's an outcome. And if it's a, if it's a school it's informed outcome, I'm all for it because our resources are finite and uh, resources of talent and time and energy as well as money. On the other hand, if we see that uh, there are uh, uh, there are interconnections among working groups. Let's uh, let's optimize those as well. And I I, I, I have a, a few ideas about how future uh, expert um, witnesses who will be coming before the commission will have topics that I think likely will uh, fit within existing now existing working groups. So we may very well see the mandate of one or more or all of the working groups expand and then consolidate and reshape as an amoeba might in our petri dish uh so to that to that point um mark i was just as i was listening about the you know the the community investment vehicles and, and things like that i just thought about this not even started yet reparations working group and thought there might be some intersection there so Wendy, I think I still, yeah, I, I, my, my contact information on this list is actually my personal email address from when I was leaving my old role and moving to ECF. So I'm going to um, send you a note with my, uh, my updated contact information. And I'd love to just learn a little bit more about where you all are so that as we're starting, we're starting with an eye towards maybe bringing some of this stuff together down the line. You know, the other thing that occurs to me, and I'd be curious to learn, I should point out, kind of building on uh, Commissioner Freeman's point, um, Anyone who wants to add to what she's done and Wendy Raymer has done in their working group, uh, don't be bashful and don't be confined to any specific mode of communication. If you wanna raise it at one of our meetings, if you wanna phone any of us, if you wanna sit in on a meeting, all of that is fair game. There are no rules here. Um, but what I was gonna say is this, uh, from January and now it appears at least through August, uh, I have speakers lined up and topics lined up. Um, at some point before the year is out, I think we will probably have at least one meeting where by design we will not have testimony, but instead have an opportunity to kind of think through where we're at in a more systematic, cohesive, uh, integrated way, because I don't want to let any of these threads just die unless by design we've concluded, hey, there's no there there. But to the extent they have life within them, uh, let's make sure that we're not missing opportunities for cross-connectivity or e exploration as a group. And again, uh, th this a monthly witness approach seems to be a pretty effective one. It seems to engage the commission. It, the working groups seem to be very effective and engaged and committed. Uh, but by the same token, I don't know that that needs to be the only piece of the pattern. And I will rely upon all of you to tell me how you might think it might be improved. But I'm just assuming at some point we'll say, hey, let's take a couple of hours and just kind of revisit where we're at, where we're going, how we're getting there, and um, which of these ideas seems to really have legs and we're excited about them, which ones we might want to abandon because they don't really hold the promise we'd hoped they might. And I'll mention one other thing because I have a few more minutes here um, if we need it. And that is when, the, uh, when I drafted the ordinance creating the commission, which many of you know was really uh, built upon the foundation of the governor's task force 
on social innovation, entrepreneurship, and enterprise that I chaired under Governor Quinn, a couple of things were different from that task force. One of them is the um, commission um, has a second function, which we've not really utilized yet. And that is it effectively serves as a think tank. And it isn't necessarily developing actionable policy recommendations on its own, but also being available to the county board, any of the county commissioners that may in, be interested in introducing legislation or any uh, uh, regulations that might be under consideration at the county level and any of the departments or agencies to ensure that um, there are not unintended uh, negative externalities in terms of social impact and to ensure that any uh, positive social externalities are maximized. Uh, because any legislator or regulator, you know, tends to have blinders on with a specific goal in mind, not necessarily being fully mindful of or sensitive to the implications around the initiative. And we have that uh, capacity within our mandate as well. Uh, we've not yet done it, uh, but we can do it. And uh, I'd be curious to learn from any of you, uh, if you have any thoughts about existing county rules, regulations, legislation, that you think could stand improvements or revision or updating uh, to maximize social impact. So I'll, I'll throw that out at you based upon your own experience or your organization's experience. Again, I will also uh, offer up as I did in conversations, I think with each of you individually, if you have topics or experts that you would like to speak before the, uh, the commission, um, share them with me and we'll, uh, we'll put them in the queue. Uh, we have lots of people interested in talking with us uh, and as I say, many of them may connect with others of them, and we may want to bring them together. Uh, you know, our meetings tend to be, two hours can be a very short time or a very long time. I find it to be a pretty short time, given the, the, my interest in the topics that have been presented so far, and I hope you share that. Uh, but, you know, I, I want to make sure that our time is used well and efficiently, and I'm deeply grateful to all of you for committing to this effort. I think it's a really important one. I think really good things are going to come from it. But if you have people or ideas that you want to bring forward, uh, reach out to me and I'll be delighted to, uh, to hear from you and, uh, and make that happen. So thanks to each of you for, for all you have done and all that you are doing in your day jobs, as well as what you're doing here once a month on a Thursday afternoon, and also what you're doing within working groups between those meetings. So uh, I don't know if there's any other business to come before the meeting. We've got a couple of questions, Mark. Please, Commissioner Raymer. Yeah, but Christy, you had yours up. I noticed yours was up first. Oh, I missed so. that. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, two things. Just wanted to uh, because you uh, you set the table, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sit down and uh, and Have partake. Um, SSMMA, South Suburban Mayors and Managers, is yes. um, uh, looking at. Um, potential ordinance or, you know, some legislative matter uh, before the county board. I, it's premature right now, but I just want to give everybody a heads up. We're looking at uh, food desert issues and really kind of the health impact and whatnot. So want to just plant the seed and say that we've got some very preliminary uh, discussions going with a couple of champ uh, uh, commissioner champions and, um, you know, to, local to the South suburbs, but <clears throat> intend this to be, you know, a movement that really addresses some of the concerns that, uh, that we find that it's hard for full service grocers to go into some areas because uh, the costs are seen as prohibitive. Well, I, I, and, uh, I appreciate your calling that out. Yeah, and and unless use, you are already working with Commissioner Cooley on this very effort, are you by chance? Um, actually, Commissioner uh, Miller is who we're starting with, but if Commissioner Co Cooley is somebody to... I, I, well, Commissioner know, Cooley yeah. and I have had conversations <laughs> on collateral topics within the last several days, and there will be some movement forward on the food front. So I, I, I do suggest that you chat with him, but also perhaps the three of us can schedule a call at your convenience and I we can uh, see how we might uh, 
consolidate these topics into something that will the commission can be very yeah absolutely and, it, and if i may um because i'm going to have to sign off in just a minute i just want to uh, compliment everyone for not only the fantastic speakers but the really informed and thoughtful uh discussions and comments that you all made it was really interesting to hear the dialogue i also want to share that the legislation that i uh informed you of last uh last month actually passed the following day. So we have, um, we're awaiting the governor's signature on that. That's a Southern Reactivation Act, which is a, a tool to bring tax exempt parcels at the community level uh, back on the tax rolls. So really interested in participating uh, with, uh, super, or with Commissioner Yonan and um, the, the uh, Reverend on the repurposing or thoughtfulness of, uh, church properties. So I volunteered to serve on that. I think I've got a perspective that I can share and hopefully be constructive in that discussion. Very much appreciated, Christy. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm sure John will be happy to have your involvement in there that as well. Thanks. Was there another? Uh, yeah, yeah, I had. Please. Two things. One, um, your thought about having a meeting where you know, we just discuss and we don't have a presenter. I love that. And perhaps we could use that as well um, to talk about like a, do we, are we wanting a year end report, an yes, impact the, report uh, the, kind the, of the, the um, ordinance, really? The ordinance good. requires that. And we do that. Yeah. Every year. So yeah. I think maybe that would be a nice, you know, thing to kind of do in that moment as well. And then the second thing is, um, you know, the think tank, you know, perspective of, we're feeding things up, but we want to also, you know, have them feed things to us to, to discuss. Um, this is going back a bit, but there was a presentation on how Cook County, the plans for Cook County to spend um, COVID recovery dollars, you know, and how it was segmented into, you know, um, all these priority areas. It was a nice deck. It was a real, you know, uh, clear plan in place. And I'm wondering, maybe we can get an update on that and kind of see what progress has been made on kind of how those funds have been distributed, what challenges they've had, what successes they've had. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember? Does anybody remember? Yeah, so so is Commissioner Anaya. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, we actually yeah. have some really great updates in regards to ARPA. Um, so I'd be more than happy to report back at the next one. And I, I won't take up too much time. I, I understand when we have presenters, we don't want to uh, have ours too lengthy. But yeah, we'll definitely provide a, a deck of some sort with updates. And then I'll, I'll be more than yeah. happy to do that as part of the, the chair and vice chair updates in the beginning Very of the meeting. I much appreciate that, Commissioner Anaya. Thank you so much. Any other uh, comments, questions, contributions? Uh, uh, Commissioner Anaya, I think we probably, in as much as we don't have a quorum, I think we can. Uh, yeah, so maybe Mark, the last thing that I just right? want to put on the table for everyone, um, I know that this is something that you and I are discussing. Um, so we are um, still on hold in regards to how long the governor is going to extend its order for remote meetings. So there's going to be a point where we're going to either be doing hybrid or in person. So I believe that uh, Mark and myself will probably be reaching out to members to see the feasibility of doing that with, with members. I know that remote works quite well with uh, most members, um, but we just, uh, you know, if, if the order is, is no longer extended and expires, we have to look into our other options. So we'll have to circle back with you all. And I just wanted to make sure to flag that again. I know I've brought it up before. Um, so that's the last uh, thing that I'll put, that I'll say on my end. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and unless there is any other business, I think we can uh, stand adjourned given that we do not have a quorum. I'm not sure we need to go through a uh, Robert's Rules of Order uh, type process here. Uh, and uh, thank each of you for your uh, extraordinary contributions and uh, look forward to those being those continuing. And uh, I hope this work continues to uh, energize each of you as it does me. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone.